Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our third Furman at Home homecoming event. Thank you guys for joining us. Um, we are so bummed that we're not able to celebrate with everyone in person for homecoming, but um, are very thankful to have you guys joining us today. My name is Sarah Zabo, and I work in the Office of Alumni and Parent Engagement. And we are super excited for today's presentation. I'm sure that we will all learn something new about Furman today, no doubt. Um, before I turn it over to my friend and colleague, John Kemp, who's gonna introduce our special guest, um, just wanna let you guys know that Courtney has allowed a couple minutes on the back end to answer any questions that you guys might have about the presentation or about Furman. So feel free to submit any questions you have in the little Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. Um, and without further ado, I'm gonna kick it over to John. Well, good afternoon, everybody. I'm John Kemp, I'm a 95 alumnus and work in the development office. Uh, happy homecoming virtually. Uh, in that development capacity, I have one brief announcement before I introduce Dr. Tolleson. If you've not heard about the homecoming hats, I wanna be sure you're aware of them. I'll drop a link in the, the Q&A chat box. Um, they are great hats to celebrate homecoming, not just for this year, but going forward. And they're for $35, 25 of which becomes a gift in support of the Four Furman Fund, which is part of the university's response to COVID-19. So just check that out in the chat for later reference. Uh, and without further ado, uh, Dr. Courtney Tylison is our distinguished university public historian and scholar at Furman University. She's taught at Furman for nearly 17 years. She's a 99 alumna of Furman and the university's history holds special interest for her. She's the founding director of the Furman University Oral History Project. She served on the university task force on slavery and justice and is active in efforts to not only present and preserve campus history, but also contextualize and design campus spaces. So Courtney, thank you very much. And uh, we look forward to your presentation. Thank you, John. And thank you for that kind introduction and for asking me to speak today and to participate in um, this historic event. It actually occurred to me last night when I was uh, thinking about this presentation that uh, while we're talking about Furman's history, we're also making history. <laughs> I've spent a lot of time since March uh, thinking about the Spanish influenza and um, you know, just the events of just over 100 years ago, there's been a lot of public interest in that and writing, you know, about Greenville, writing about Furman during that time period and undoubtedly scholars of Furman's past in the future will write about our very first, um, hopefully it will not become an annual, <laughs> just our very first, hopefully and only virtual homecoming. So I'm going to go ahead and um, start this from the very beginning. My presentation today is titled An Unusual Approach to Furman's Past. So I thought we could have a little bit of fun with, um, with the presentation today. All right. Let's see. Well, I'm trying to. Here we go. Um, can everyone see the full slide? Okay, or is my Zoom in the way? Everybody good? All right. I thought we'd start off by talking a little bit about our namesake, Richard Furman. Uh, Richard Furman was born in upstate New York around Poughkeepsie, Hyde Park uh, area. That's where um, President FDR, FDR's home um, is has been preserved in Hyde Park. He was born in 1755, so he would be 265 years old this October. Um, and he came south, his family came south when he was 10 months old and he spent the rest of his life in the south. And I imagine that their you know, horse and buggy had this bumper sticker on it. I wasn't born in the south, but I got here as fast as I could. Um, they soon, they moved to Sumter district initially, but apparently that did not suit them because very soon after they moved to Charleston, his father was a schoolmaster and, um, Richard Furman had one formal year of schooling, but was largely self-educated. He was born into the Anglican faith, which was very typical of, of these times. 
and converted to the Baptist faith as a teenager. He was also ordained as a Baptist minister as a teenager. And even by the standards of, of that day, he was ordained at a fairly young age. He was an impressionable youth who matured in the years of the French and Indian War when frustration with the British was increasing. And he became politically active. He apparently was a very talented orator. And he used these oratorical skills to convert loyalists into patriots. He became friends with Swamp, Front, Swamp Fox Francis Marion and also with General Thomas Sumter, um, John Rutledge, um, well-known name in South Carolina history, persuaded him to become a propagandist um, among the loyalists in Western South Carolina, which is of course where Furman is located today. And he did so with remarkable success. So according to Daughters of the American Revolution records, when Charleston fell to the British in 1780, General Thomas Cornwallis, British General Cornwallis, um, was determined to make an example of Richard Furman. And he put a price of 1,000 pounds on Richard Furman's head. He allegedly said that he feared the prayers of the godly youth more than the armies of Marion and Sumter. This forced Richard Furman to flee the state. He went into Virginia and he spent some time in Virginia. He preached in Virginia. Patrick Henry of Give Me Liberty or Give Me Death fame was actually one of his congregants. Um, years later, when uh, after Patrick Henry died, uh, Richard Furman was, was um, coming south after one of the triennial conventions, which I'll mention in just a moment. And he rode far out of his way to go visit Patrick Henry's widow. He was a delegate. He was also politically active. He was a delegate to South Carolina's first constitutional convention and was very involved in disestablishing Anglicanism as the official religion and establishing in South Carolina's first constitution religious liberty. He maintained his reputation as a fervent patriot throughout his life. After George Washington died, and again after Alexander Hamilton died, which is, of course, you know, a lot more well known now <laughs> at the hands of, of Aaron Burr than it was, um, you know, maybe five or ten years ago. Um, the Society of Cincinnatus in Charleston asked Richard Furman to give the principal eulogies for the city of Charleston for those two men. Furman was a staunch advocate of education, and it's a, it's important to keep a few things in mind contextually. So his father was a schoolmaster. Um, he had a school on what is now Daniel Island, actually. Education was very much in vogue at this time as a means of educating the first generations of Americans so they could be better prepared to defend and nurture our country in its earliest years. We were young, we were vulnerable. We will, these people, this generation of, of youths who, who grow up during the revolution, who were educated in the years soon thereafter, will be called upon to defend the country in the War of 1812, not too long after the Revolutionary War years. Richard Furman was also a leader in the Baptist faith, and he was very concerned with developing the faith nationally and also educating young men to nurture the spread of the faith nationally. Richard Furman established this apprentice system um, to educate young men in which they would attend academies and then eventually would go on if they were, you know, if they sort of excelled at the academic, the academy level, they would go on to um, Rhode Island College, which is now Brown University. He had a lot of contacts at Rhode Island College. Richard Furman was involved in the establishment of South Carolina College, which is now the University of South Carolina. He actually suggested its first president, Jonathan Maxey from Rhode Island College. Um, and Richard Furman was also involved in the establishment of Columbian College, which is now George Washington University. Furman, of course, the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, which grew out of Furman's theological department, Mercer University, and, and others. 
he was the leading Baptist of his day. He was the president uh, of and founder and president of the Triennial Convention, which is which was a national gathering of Baptists across the this this young nation. He's elected president twice. Um, and he also was very focused on creating a denominational structure, a state denominational structure. And he proposed state Baptist conventions and was the founder and father, considered the father of the South Carolina Baptist Convention. He was president between 1821 and 1824. Um, <clears throat> early on, he was a slaveholder and early on, he, you know, in those sort of 1780s, um, 1770s, 1780s, he was an outspoken advocate of, of reform. Um, and he referred to slavery as undoubtedly an evil. Now, this was before Eli Whitney's invention of the cotton gin, which just absolutely exploded cotton production, not only for a small group of, of planters, um, that hugged the South Carolina and other, you know, coasts along um, the new country, but also inland, you know, after starting around 1800, 1810, you start to see cotton proliferating, even in the area of South Carolina where Furman is located. So later he, he referred to slavery as quote, economically necessarily necessary and morally justified. Now, in 1822, the, cl the climate, the racial climate in South Carolina changed fairly significantly after um, the, the squashing of what would have been um, the largest slave insurrection in American history at the time when Denmark Vesey, his plan in Charleston um, to rise up um, was squashed by, uh, by white leaders. The Charleston Association hoped for a day of, of to proclaim a day of public thanksgiving, um, public humiliation and thanksgiving. And this was in response to both the fact that the Denmark Vesey insurrection had been squashed and also a recent hurricane had missed Charleston. And so this was also considered, you know, part of why they wanted this day of public humi humility and thanksgiving. So um, Furman was asked to write the governor of South Carolina asking for this particular day. It's evidently how he spent Christmas Eve 1822, which I'm sure his family was thrilled that he was working so hard on this on Christmas Eve. And the, the document that he wrote, a lot has been made about the document that he wrote, and a lot of it has been taken out of context in terms of the reasons why he wrote this. Um, it was titled, The Exposition of the Views of the Baptists Relative to the Colored Population of the United States. And it foreshadowed the intellectual and religious arguments that white Southerners would make for the next four decades to defend slavery. And we could talk a little bit more about that later on if you guys are are interested. He died in 1825. And um, soon thereafter, a group of South Carolina Baptist leaders petitioned the state legislature for a charter for an academy, and they named that the Furman Academy and Theological Institution. And classes began in January of 1827. And this is what we believe the original schoolhouse looked like. I'm not going to tell you where it started or where else it moved because I believe there are other plans for that later as part of homecoming festivities. So we do have Richard Furman to thank for our, for our monogram. And we said. also, sorry, my watch started talking to me. We have Richard Furman to thank for our monogram and we are one of the 50 oldest institutions of higher education nationally. I want to jump forward a little bit into the early 20th century, since we are in the midst of a quarantine. I thought it might be interesting to, um, to gain a little bit of perspective on the fact that six times between 1905 and 1920, Furman students were quarantined. We are most familiar with the 1918-1919 Spanish influenza, but they were quarantined 
um, also on account of scarlet fever, measles, and meningitis. And the two photographs at the top are from 1906, are from Furman students quarantined um, in the residence halls together from Scarlatina. I also thought it would be interesting to mention uh, another fun little fact about Furman history. So after World War I, the Doughboy, which you can see pictured here and here on the old campus, Doughboys proliferated around the country. There are over 450 Doughboys nationally around the country. Every community wanted one uh, to honor young men who had served in World War I, who died in World War I. And um, they were they were cast by a gentleman, they were created and cast by a gentleman named Ernest Moore Bikaini, who was in America's Georgia. And um, there was sort of a furious race to get these as soon as possible. And the one that you see here on the downtown men's campus uh, was installed in June of 1921. The war ended, of course, the 11th hour of the 11th day, the 11th month of 1918. Um, and in June of 1921, Furman's Doughboy became the first Doughboy, first of all 400 and something Doughboys nationally, to be installed and dedicated. So there are actually people, there's some websites that speak to this, who spend vacations driving around and love to take pictures of doughboys all around the country and their doughboy aficionados. And the Furman, the original Furman doughboy is a highlight uh, for them because it was indeed the first to be installed and dedicated. In this image over here, you see, um, so you see um, members of the military during World War II saluting the original doughboy. In 2004, um, the original Doughboy was actually removed from campus and a new one was recast. And so the Doughboy that we have at the center of our small military plaza that's near Paladin Stadium is a newer Doughboy. Doughboy. The original now lives in the Upcountry History Museum downtown. Okay, so speaking of the downtown campuses, I'm sure many of you are aware of the fact that Furman um, from 1851 onward was located downtown Greenville near the South Carolina Governor School and where the County Square offices currently are today. And of course, in the 1930s, it merged with the Greenville Women's College to become co-educational, but continued operating on two separate campuses, um, just over a mile apart from each other. The Greenville Women's College campus was located on um, where Heritage Green is today, where the Upcountry History Museum is, and um, the Art Museum, the Greenville Little Theater, the Children's Museum, and I'm very, I try to be careful whenever I talk about these campuses and refer to them um, as the downtown campuses because when I was doing oral history with an older Furman graduate, I, um, I was very kindly and quietly stopped in the middle of the interview and he leaned over and he put his hand on my hand and he said, darling, I know I'm an old man but if you, I'd appreciate it if you could refer to it as the men's old campus and not the old men's campus. So it is safer for me to just refer to them as the downtown campuses. Um, and here you see some amazing images. This is the Greenville Women's College campus. Um, here is the original Florentine bell tower. Here's an aerial shot of the Furman campus and here you can see the bell tower. Um, the Greenville Women's College had a separate structure that was named after President Ramsey, the Ramsey Fine Arts Center, and it functioned as Greenville's premier performing arts venue for a very long time. And here is an image from the World War II era in which you see women 
leaving here you can see the Ramsey Fine Arts Center um, going running <laughs> to go get in this small van. Uh, the van would uh, shuttle the women and, and men back and forth between the two campuses because they were taking classes on, on both campuses. So, and speaking of the new campus, um, about the time, a few years after World War II, Berman trustees realized they were landlocked. They realized that um, they needed more space. In 1946, Furman had the highest enrollments it had ever had in its history. This is, of course, relating to the GI Bill, which provided free tuition for returning World War II um, veterans. Also, the decade before that, the 1930s had been the Great Depression. And so um, there were a lot of maintenance issues that had been delayed um, throughout the 30s and then because of rationing um, building materials throughout the 1940s. So building materials and, and delayed maintenance um, had been building up for about a 15 year period. It was incredibly overcrowded and morale was pretty low. The students complained. You can look in the student newspapers and and read the complaints from the students just about how unhappy they are with the current state of the campus. So trustees began to entertain the option of moving. They looked at large plots of land. One of the plots that they considered is the current location of Prisma, what is now the Greenville Health System recently evolved to become the Prisma Health System at the corner of Grove and Ferris Roads on the west side of, of Greenville. They were very fond, however, of the land where the Furman campus currently is today. Here is an image of what the trustees saw when they went to visit. The land of the current Furman campus was blanketed in cotton. There were also cow pastures there. There was a fairly extensive moonshine operation on the uh, creek that runs behind Paladin Stadium. And apparently there was one resident living on the land, Mrs. Hawkins. And you could see Mrs. Hawkins right there. This is an image in the lower left corner of the 1953 groundbreaking ceremony for the new campus. And the top two images are shots of a very, very young campus. Um, this is Duke Library under construction. And you can see just how tiny the trees are. <laughs> and over here, you can see um, a shot of the campus, again, very, very early on and, and how empty it is. Um, the front fountain here hasn't, hasn't been installed. Um, and we'll talk, we'll talk more about the development of the campus soon. Here's another shot, another early shot of the campus. You know, you could see straight through to the administration building in Furman Hall through the front gates. Of course, these trees are so built up now. It's, um, it's hard to get the vista, the view of, of Furman Hall and the administration building until, you know, you're about right here and entering, uh, entering campus. Let's talk about our beloved bell tower, the iconic symbol of Furman. The Florentine bell tower was originally part of a building known as Old Main, which was officially known as Richard Furman Hall, but more commonly referred to by students as Old Main on the downtown campus. And when it came time to move to the new campus, it was too fragile to be moved. And so a gentleman named Carl Clausen, who you see pictured here, um, he passed away not that long ago. He was in charge of facilities and the development of the new campus. And so he could not find blueprints for the 1851 structure. They did not exist. So he went downtown and he scaled the bell tower and he created, he measured and 
measured impeccably, apparently, and created blueprints. I should also mention, uh, if any of you are, are familiar with the Wofford College campus, this design, the original design from 1851 might look familiar. The original design actually included two bell towers that flanked the center building. And Wofford's used the same design and, and actually erected both bell towers. Furman only erected one. So back to the late 50s and early 60s. Um, Carl Clausen created blueprints and a new bell tower on the new campus was built. Originally, it was supposed to be located in the middle of the Rose Garden. And they were going to do a smaller replica of the bell tower. But Clausen said, wouldn't it be beautiful on a peninsula out on the lake where the carillon would, the bells of the carillon would reverberate across the water and it could be lit at night and everyone loved that idea, and that is exactly what happened. Uh, the current bell tower is within one sixteenth an inch of the dimensions of the original. It was pretty remarkable, in my opinion. I interviewed Mr. Clausen about maybe 10 or 15 years ago, and he and I were sitting in the administration building in the president's suite talking, and it was it was summertime. I remember it was a particularly warm, warm summer day. And we were talking about the bell tower. And it was obvious to me, even when he was in his 80s, how much he still loved it. And he became so excited. He said, let's go. And I said, OK. So I followed him. We walked from the administration building to the bell tower where he proceeded to absolutely shame me. Um, I was not wearing appropriate shoes that day and climbed to the top of his beloved bell tower. It's a wonderful, um, wonderful memory and a wonderful story. And the bell tower apparently has a birthday and its birthday was yesterday. The birthday was the date of its dedication in 1964. Bell Tower turned 56 years old yesterday. Have you ever wondered why Furman is known as the Country Club of the South and why we have so many fountains? Well, when the campus was being planned in the mid 50s, the Plylers took a trip to England and to France. Mrs. Plyler loved the English Rose Gardens. She loved the fountains at Versailles. And they sent word back to campus that they wanted a rose garden and they wanted lots of fountains. The trustees hired the same architectural firm that had recently restored Colonial Williamsburg. And they hired landscape architects that had designed the National Mall in DC and areas surrounding the Lincoln Memorial. South Carolina Baptist Convention leaders at the time were a bit skeptical as, why, as to why Furman was spending so much money on the new campus and began referring to it to Furman's Board of Trustees as that country club board. I still have a t-shirt that uh, I was gifted during my college years that has the bell tower and the lake and um, sort of a, you know, an image of Furman on the back of it. And it says Country Club of the South. And I keep it for historic purposes, even though uh, you don't really hear that the campus described that day. Although we continue to make the top five and most beautiful college campuses around the country. So these are all shots, of course, you all will recognize these of the Furman campus. And these are the fountains at Versailles and um, an English rose garden, garden um, at Batemans in, um, in Surrey, um, not too far outside of London. It's a, it's a um, 17th, 18th century home that Roger Kipling actually lived in until his death in 1936. 
Let's talk about the residence halls on campus. So those of you who were, who attended Furman around the time that I did in the mid to late nineties and earlier will remember that there was the women's side of campus and the men's side of campus. And they were known as the men's residence halls and the women's dorms. And um, there were a few women who lived on the men's side of campus in Blackwell after Blackwell um, was built. That was a co-educational dorm. But for the most part, things remained gender segregated. So here is an image from, I believe, 1912 of the Greenville Women's College campus. Here's a 1912 image, actually. Um, and you could see it is a series of interconnected buildings. The buildings, in, inside the buildings, um, the women slept, the women ate, there was a dining hall, a dining room, um, classrooms, space for exercise for calisthenics. Mary Camilla Judson introduced calisthenics um, to the young women. Uh, there was also a swimming pool in the basement. And the idea here was to keep the women safe and secure so they didn't have to leave this series of interconnected buildings. Um, and here you have Judson, which is the center part of the women's dorms, which are now known as Lakeside Housing today with parlors downstairs. This is an image of one of the, the four um, historically male residence halls. And I like this, I like to show this image over here, although it's kind of hard to see, but I'll tell you, I'll tell you about it. The original plans had four separate buildings for the men surrounding a quad, and that is what was built. The original plans for the women's side of campus had several disconnected buildings all surrounding a lagoon. That did not happen because in the mid 1950s, there was this idea of in loco parentis that colleges served in place of parents while young women were away at college. This is an era in which dorm mothers ruled, <laughs> ruled the roost uh, and, and, and rules <laughs> regarding women's behavior, um, attire, curfews, et cetera, et cetera. And a decision was made to actually change the design to keep the women more safe and secure. And so nine residence halls were constructed as a series of interconnected buildings with kitchens, with parlors, um, and obviously places um, for the women to sleep as well. And this is absolutely a result of this 1950s in loco parentis mentality. So the, inter the, the separate distinct buildings around the lagoon plan was eliminated. This didn't always, um, the buildings that were the structure of, and design of the buildings on the Greenville Women's College campus on Heritage Green didn't always um, deter young men who were enamored with the students during World War I. Men from Camp Severe um, would try to have late night rendezvous with young women at the Greenville Women's College and it actually prompted the stationing of a military policeman on, on the campus during those war years. Also, the original design for campus had uh, visitors, students, faculty, staff driving through the front gates and immediately in front of you would be, you would be facing a chapel. This was the original design for the campus. Ironically, while we were affiliated with the South Carolina Baptist Convention, we never officially had a chapel. Chapel was required until 1968 and chapel took place in McAllister Auditorium. In 1992, about five weeks after Furman officially split 
from the South Carolina Baptist Convention. And this is an image from the press conference in which you can see President Johns and Chair of the Board of Trustees, Amazon Nickel Daniel, um, announcing this. About five, um, well, actually this photo was taken a little bit earlier. About five weeks after um, the, the official split, it was about a two year process um, to split from the South Carolina Baptist Convention, Amazel Mickle uh, Daniel died. And about a third of the 24 and a half million bequests to Furman was specifically earmarked for a chapel on campus. So I find it very ironic that we never had a chapel during the days of the South Carolina, the South Carolina Baptist Convention days. And then Mrs. Daniel was so involved uh, between 1990 and 1992 in, um, in shepherding the board during those very tumultuous years. And soon after she died, we had a chapel. Speaking of Mrs. Daniel, here she is again at a groundbreaking for the um, music building that is named for her. For, this is when Furman was also bequeathed White Oaks. This was the Daniels home. It was designed by noted Atlanta-based architect, Philip Schutze, and it is a replica of the Colonial Governor's Palace in Williamsburg, Virginia. So this is an image of that structure in Williamsburg, and this is an image from White Oaks. <clears throat> All right, the move to the new campus also prompted the unification of the mascot. Um, before September 1961, Furman had multiple mascots, according to the team. The basketball team were known as the Purple Paladins, the football team were known at various times as the Mountaineers, the Hornets, and then the Purple Hurricane. The baseball team was known as the Purple Hornets. And in, 19, in September 1961, the students said, enough. <laughs> We're all together on one campus now, male, females. We should also unify under one mascot. And so they had a vote in the student newspaper, which at the time was named the Hornet. And the students voted on the Paladin to become the mascot. This is an image from, um, this is an image from 19, the 1925 football team. This is an image from the 1940, members of the 1946 um, football team. This is an image from Frank Selvey in 1954, who was a Purple Paladin, um, the baseball team. And here you can see um, our mascot today. That's sort of an old um, logo here with the Furman Purple Hurricanes. Um, and also in the 1950s, the mid-1950s, the Furman Hornet newspaper was named the top college newspaper. Okay. Here is an image taken just before John Johns's inauguration. President Blackwell had been in office and he had come from Florida State University. And when he came from Florida State University, he brought the, uh, he modified a Florida State cheer. <laughs> And well, I'll talk a little bit more about this modification of this cheer in just a moment, but I should quickly mention at the inauguration, which took place in 1977, um, newspapers around the country apparently had some fun with this. Uh, I can't find the actual headline in a newspaper, but have no fear. I am on a relentless pursuit and I will find it one day, but you can see here Newspapers all over the country ran advanced stories that headline Furman installs Johns. One came back from Arkansas with the note, hope you enjoy modern plumbing as much as we do. All right, <laughs> getting back to the uh, F you all the time cheer. 
President Blackwell modified the cheer and then it didn't last very long. Um, but John Johns brought it back with renewed vigor. His administration was, you know, it started out humorously <laughs> with the Furman installs Johns and it remained that way throughout. Um, Dr. Johns often received letters from especially um, South Carolina Baptist officials stating that the cheer was vulgar, stating that the cheer was inappropriate. And I've been told that he would always write them back and state that it represented a tribute to the football team that had won the Southern, Southern Conference Championship three times and that we hoped they would win it all the time. And then he would write, I'm so sorry if you find this if this offends you and you find it vulgar, but if you could write me back and please explain specifically why you find it so vulgar. And apparently he never received a response from any of those folks. We've become immune to our unusual monogram, but that doesn't necessarily mean that others, <laughs> others are immune to this. So in conclusion, since we're poking fun at our un unusual initials, I'd like to thank former Vice President for Student Affairs, Harry Shecker, for bringing my attention to what most must be undoubtedly the most notorious freshman orientation t-shirt ever officially sanctioned by a university. And that is F U till your purple. <laughs> and that's it. <laughs> happy homecoming i'm going to stop my screen at this point in time and i am happy to take any questions that might have come through if you all have any courtney thank you for that you are such a wealth of knowledge <laughs> i'm curious to know in your all of your research that you've done about Furman, what is the strangest or most unusual or funniest thing about Furman that you have come across in all of your research? Oh gosh, that's quite a question. Um, and unfortunately, I don't have a great answer off the top of my of of my head, but I I find I find the people most fascinating, the people who have been involved at Furman, you know, um, Furman had a string of, of graduates who served as president. That's really unusual for a university to have was six or seven decades or so in which, in which back to back, the president of the university was also a graduate of the university. I think that went a long way in creating this notion of the Furman family. And one of my favorite stories, it's not really unusual or, or quirky, but um, I loved the insight that, um, that the story reveals. John Johns began always speaking of Furman as, as a, the Furman family. And um, at his funeral, um, Jeff Rogers, who's a pr former um, professor of religion and former dean at, at Furman, talked about that. And he, you know, there were some skeptics who said, oh, Furman family, whatever. But he talked about John Johns's upbringing. He grew up, um, his father was a Baptist minister and his parents ran a Baptist orphanage in Florida. And so John Johns's notion of a group of people, a group of, you know, sort of religiously minded people coming together living together, learning together, worshiping together, supporting and nurturing each other was a notion of, was, was the notion of a family. And so, and he brought that approach to the Furman campus. And so I really, I love that story. And I love, um, you know, the symbolism behind it from, from John Johns's background as well. And, and um, I hope we can always keep that, that, that feeling, that spirit of, of a family, you know, going on campus.
I love that. I've been at Furman for two years now, and I definitely feel like Furman is is 100% a family. So that's really special. I love that. Um, we do have a question that came in from a um, 68, 67, 68 grad, a freshman, and um, Susie wants to know if required chapel and convocation ended in 1968. Uh, yes, that is my understanding. So this was during the um, Vietnam period <clears throat> in which students began protesting on campus. And one of the main organizations, <clears throat> excuse me, that led this um, was um, the called an, the, the SSOC, the Southern Student Organizing Committee. Now, if you look into the history of SSOC, it's primarily known regionally as a civil rights organization among college students. There were chapters at, you know, college and universities throughout the South, but it evolved into an anti-war organization um, in the, in the late 1960s. And Furman actually had the largest SSOC chapter in the state of South Carolina, which when I first came across that, I thought, wow, that's very unusual because I don't typically think of Furman students as being, um, you know, politically radical. And this was considered one of the more progressive radical organizations. But what, what drew so many people to the SSOC chapter at Furman was that they localized the issues that the chapter took on. So they were very supportive of civil rights progress. They did oppose the war. At one point in time, they took a bunch of the, stole probably a bunch of the uniforms um, from ROTC and put them on and had a march up and down the mall calling themselves, and you can surmise the acronym, the Furman University Corps of Kazoos. But the main reason why they had such an extensive um, base on campus was because of the localized issues. Um, they were the ones who were um, lead, who led the effort to um, to eliminate the two years of required ROTC service among all male students. That ended in the late '60s. Um, they were the ones who ended mandatory chapel attendance as well. That ended in the late in the late 1960s. They also were very instrumental in. Um, you know, liberating a lot of the women's women's uh, women's uh, students from a lot of the rules and regulations that had previously um, applied only to to female students at Furman as well. So chapel continued, but it was no longer required the way that it had been before. Thank you, Courtney. I know you are um, short on time, so we do have a couple questions that I want to get to because we are getting a couple questions about the accuracy, which this is funny. I've never heard this. Um, I heard from time to time that Furman once had a mascot called the Christian Knight, which came with an obvious acronym problem. <laughs> is that historically accurate or is that maybe just a rumor? Nope, that's a rumor. That's a rumor. We were never the Christian knights. <laughs> well, the a medieval knight, you know, in the court of Charlemagne, but we were never known as the Christian knights. Um, and I also saw some things on um, on Facebook yesterday um, from individuals who commented on on remembering the move of the bell tower from downtown to the new campus and. Um, how, you know, the current bell tower is the same as, as the original. And those, those are, those are, um, those are not true either. Sadly, we tried to bring it back, to, tried to take it with us, but we couldn't. And what do you know? I'll let this, um, I want to be mindful of your time. So wrap up maybe after this question, but do you know how the history of how dancing was allowed on campus? That also started, yes, with SSOC and under um, President Blackwell. So um, Blackwell had a great relationship with students. You know, this was during a, a fairly tumultuous era on college campuses um, in which, you know, um, 
there were, you know, students at, you know, Columbia University and all around the University of Michigan, all around the country, you know, attacking ROTC buildings. I mean, the Vietnam era, the civil rights era, um, the second wave of feminism provoked, provoked a lot of, of um, uncertainty and protest on campus. Kent State massacre, you know, um, et cetera, et cetera. And there were definitely firm and equivalents of a lot of, a lot of these things. Dr. Blackwell's response to this was to hold sort of FDR, <laughs> President Roosevelt style fireside chats. Um, you know, during the Great Depression and World War II, President Roosevelt addressed Americans regularly on the radio. And that had such a calming effect. President Blackwell had been a student at Furman in the 1930s and had actually <laughs> was very supportive of, of FDR and FDR's sort of New Deal policies and was, was called into the president's office in the 1930s for um, writing a socialist op-ed <laughs> in the student newspaper. But when he was president, President Blackwell decided that he was going to do something very similar and he started hosting fireside chats in the Watkins room um, of the current, you know, university center. And there are some great images of them sort of sitting by a small fireplace and students sitting all around him and he's on the microphone. So it's being broadcast, you know, on the, the Furman radio network, but, um, and students could ask him anything. And this had, this went very, very far in keeping the peace on campus. And a group of students decided that they were going to host the first dance on campus. And um, Blackwell realized the tide was turning. And so um, he met with the students, he spoke with the students, he listened to them and he jumped on board with it. And there was a dance hosted in the dining hall in which he and Mrs. Blackwell um, attended the dance. He apparently was wearing overalls um, and came to this dance and he and Mrs. Blackwell danced to the dance alongside students. And that's when on campus dancing started. I love it. I can't imagine a time where dancing was not allowed on campus, but I'm glad Furman got it. <laughs> <laughs> Courtney, thank you so much for your time today. I know that everybody um, definitely learned something. I know I did. Happy belated birthday to the bell tower. <laughs> That's yes. great. We are going to be hosting another trivia night next Tuesday. So if anyone on the call is um, planning on attending, you might see some of these fun facts that Courtney shared with us in trivia next week. So Courtney, thank you for your time. Um, I got a lot of comments in the Q&A just about how wonderful your presentation was. So thank, thank you for, for sharing your time and your wisdom with us and for being such a special part of this year's virtual homecoming. Thank you so much for asking me. I love, I love, um, love Furman, love talking about Furman's history. It's fascinating to me. And um, we're coming up on our 200 year anniversary in um, 2026. I'm already talking with um, President Davis and um, Provost Peterson about how the university is going to be celebrating and commemorating that. So please stay tuned for that. And I do see a lot of comments in the Q&A, um, including some about Richard Furman and his slaveholding past. So I really, those are important questions. Um, and so Sarah, if you and I could get together um, and I'm, I'm happy to respond to those moving forward via email um, or somehow, that would be wonderful. Yes, yes, I will um, I will connect you via email with some of the folks that have some, some questions, but I wanna be mindful of your time because I know you gotta scoot off to um, another call. So thank you again, Courtney. Thank you everyone for joining us. Um, happy homecoming. We wish we could see you guys in person, but hopefully in 2021. <laughs> thank you everyone. Take care, be safe. <laughs> Bye, happy homecoming. <laughs>